The biggest nightmare has come to life. Russia has fired all its ICBMs, or long-range nuclear missiles. Launch sites and submarines across Russia have triggered a terrifying sequence, sending many missiles heading for the U.S. The volume of these missiles could easily overpower the most advanced missile defense systems. Trying to stop just one long-range missile is hard enough, but stopping hundreds with countless nuclear warheads seems impossible. In short, we're fu- <laughs> Thankfully, that's never happened. Yet. Since the conflict in Ukraine began, the fear of nuclear war has been higher than in many years. With Russian military forces facing tough times in Ukraine, the pressure on Putin to consider nuclear options has intensified. Given the looming threat of nuclear conflict, how many nuclear weapons could the U.S. feasibly shoot down? Before we talk about how the U.S. can stop a nuclear missile, let's quickly go over what missile defense means. Since World War II, ballistic missiles have been key military tools. These missiles can fly high and far to hit specific spots, and they're launched from the ground or sea. Their main types differ in how far they can go and what they can carry, from hitting close targets to reaching across the world. The short-range ballistic missiles, or SRBMs, can travel up to 620 miles and are mainly used for close targets like enemy bases. The medium-range ballistic missiles, or MRBMs, can hit targets 620 to 2,170 miles away, like deeper enemy areas. The intermediate-range ballistic missiles, or IRBMs, can hit across continents with a reach of 2,170 to 3,410 miles. The intercontinental ballistic missiles, or ICBMs, are the longest range, going over 3,410 miles, often carrying nuclear weapons. They are very hard to stop because they achieve hypersonic speeds, cruising at Mach 10 to Mach 20, approximately 7,600 to 15,200 miles per hour, which is about 10 to 20 times the speed of sound. They can also carry many warheads, multiplying their destructive potential. Short and medium range missiles are often used in regional conflicts or as a deterrent within a specific theater of operations, while the intermediate range ones extend the strategic reach of a country's military. The ICBMs are the backbone of many national nuclear deterrence strategies intended to threaten or deliver retaliatory strikes over intercontinental distances. But just what would happen if an enemy state launched ICBMs at the U.S.? How would they detect these ICBMs and determine their target? Let's find out. By the way, if you are new here, don't forget to subscribe to never miss out on the latest uploads and updates. Detection of an ICBM launch can span up to 30 seconds, weather permitting. Cloud cover? No problem. Once the missile breaches the cloud layer, its fiery trail is picked up by infrared sensors stationed on either the venerable Defense Support Program satellites or the cutting-edge space-based infrared systems. After detection by several satellites, the missile's path is swiftly charted, though its intended target remains a mystery. This ambiguity forces the command and control to make a crucial call. Is this missile a threat? or merely part a routine exercise. A mere test launch has the potential to be misconstrued as an act of aggression, potentially triggering nuclear conflict. Do they launch countermeasures and risk an all-out war, or do they refrain from acting and risk endangering the lives of millions? Tough moment. Anyway, once the decision is made to launch an interceptor, there are multiple chances to intercept the ICBM. Whenever a ballistic missile is launched, its trajectory is divided into three distinct phases. The initial phase is known as the boost phase, during which the rocket ignites and gains momentum before moving to the subsequent phase. Following the boost phase is the mid-course phase, characterized by the missile's steady traversal along a specific trajectory. This phase encompasses the majority of the missile's journey towards its intended destination. Once this stage concludes, the missile enters the terminal phase. In the terminal phase, the missile transitions from its mid-course trajectory to a direct descent towards its target, aided by Earth's gravitational pull. This phase witnesses the peak velocity of the missile's flight and is also when it deploys its multiple independent re-entry vehicles, or MIRVs. The boost phase is arguably the most opportune time to intercept an ICBM, but paradoxically, it's the least feasible option. During the boost phase, intercepting the ICBM while its rocket engine is still active presents a significant advantage. Instead of trying to intercept a small nuclear warhead, it's much simpler to target the comparatively slower, larger, and hotter booster. However, it's a race against time, and it's not as straightforward as it might seem. Let us explain it simply. 
When an ICBM is launched, it only burns its engines for about 250 seconds, a bit over four minutes. It might take satellites around 30 seconds just to notice that an ICBM has been launched. After detecting an ICBM, it can take another 60 to 70 seconds to get an interceptor missile up into the air. This doesn't even include the time leaders need to decide to launch the interceptor. So, by the time you're ready to try and stop the ICBM, about 100 seconds have already passed since the ICBM started its journey, leaving you with just 150 seconds to try and intercept it. The missiles designed to intercept ICBMs have their own engines that burn for about 100 seconds. These interceptor missiles are guided by satellites and sensors on the ground towards the ICBM. They aim to hit the ICBM directly, a technique called hit to kill, which means they crash into the ICBM at high speed to destroy it without any explosion. This hit to kill method relies on speed and precision rather than causing an explosion near the ICBM. After a successful hit, the defense system checks using the shoot look shoot method if the ICBM has been destroyed before deciding whether to send another interceptor. This careful approach helps to save on the number of interceptors used. Destroying an ICBM while it's still boosting up into the sky sounds easy in theory, but in reality there are big challenges related to time and distance. Decision makers have very little time to act. If it takes longer than a minute to decide to launch an interceptor, it might be too late to stop the ICBM while it's still in its boost phase. There was an idea to use a laser, traveling at the speed of light, to overcome these challenges. The YL-1 airborne laser system was supposed to destroy enemy ICBMs from 115 to 200 miles away during their boost phase. However, the laser wasn't as effective as hoped because the Earth's atmosphere weakened its power more than expected. The laser's real effective range was much shorter, and the aircraft carrying it would have to fly dangerously close to enemy territory. Consequently, this program was cancelled. Another issue is the distance from which interceptors can be launched. They need to be relatively close to the ICBM's launch site to have a chance of intercepting it during the boost phase. This requirement could put the interceptor launch site at risk of being attacked. Although the American SM-3 missile, which can be launched from Navy ships or Aegis ashore systems, has the capability to intercept ICBMs, the distance and time challenges make it an impractical solution during the boost phase. Currently, the United States does not have a practical way to destroy ICBMs in their boost phase, but research into new technologies, including unmanned aerial vehicles, is ongoing. Hitting a missile when it's in the middle part of its flight, or the mid-course phase, is considered the best chance to destroy it. During this phase, the missile is up high in space and moves along a predictable path, which makes it somewhat easier to target compared to other phases of its journey. This is the time when the missile is most visible and vulnerable to defense systems, giving the defending country the best opportunity to shoot it down. The United States has focused many of its missile defense efforts on this phase because it offers a longer window of time to intercept the missile, about 20 minutes. However, despite this seemingly generous time frame, shooting down a missile at this stage is extremely challenging. Imagine trying to hit a speeding bullet with another bullet, but in this case, the bullet you're trying to hit is moving at about 15,000 miles per hour, which is around nine times faster than a regular bullet. Over the last 30 years, Countries like Russia, China, and North Korea have been working on ways to make it harder to shoot down their missiles during this vulnerable mid-course phase. They've developed missiles that can change direction while flying, or programmed them to fly in areas that are hard for U.S. radars to track, such as over the poles. The United States has two main ways to try to stop these nuclear warheads during the mid-course phase. One method uses ground-based interceptors, while the second one involves using a standard Missile 3, or SM-3, Block 2A, which can be launched from Aegis-equipped cruisers and destroyers. Let's analyze more in detail these systems. The Ground-Based Mid-Course Defense, or GMD, system is a key part of America's plan to stop intermediate and long-range ballistic missiles. It's a $40 billion project designed to keep the United States safe from missile attacks. The GMD system started being put together in the late 1990s and was ready to use by the early 2000s. It has two main locations, Fort Greeley in Alaska and Vandenberg Space Force Base in California. These sites are under the Air Force's command, which oversees the whole system. The GMD system uses radars on the ground and at sea to figure out where a missile is going. 
The Air Force collects this information and tells the two bases. If there's a missile coming, either base can shoot an interceptor missile to stop it. Each base has 44 of these interceptor missiles ready to go. A ground-based interceptor is a multi-stage solid fuel booster with an exoatmospheric kill vehicle, or EKV, which works outside the Earth's atmosphere, in space. Since there's no air in space, the EKV uses small thrusters to move and can't rely on fins like an airplane. It's sent toward the target's predicted location in space, guided by information from the ground and its own sensors. Once close enough, it crashes into the missile to destroy it without using a regular explosive. While the GMD system looked good in early tests, its success rate hasn't been as high as hoped. Out of all the tests done, there's been about a 52% chance of hitting the target with just one interceptor. But if you shoot four or more interceptors, the chances of stopping the missile go up to 97%. Efforts have been made to improve the system. For example, in 2014 and 2018, the Air Force set up new radar systems in Alaska and Hawaii. These have greatly improved the system's ability to track missiles and guide interceptors to their targets. The second way to destroy a ballistic missile is to utilize the Aegis Combat System. It's a sophisticated naval defense system that was first introduced in the 1980s with the Ticonderoga-class cruisers. It combines advanced radar systems and weapons to protect U.S. Navy ships and other targets on land and sea. The heart of the Aegis system is the SPY radar, known for being one of the best air defense radars in the world. The radar's effectiveness partly comes from operating at the optimal frequency for missile defense missions, allowing it to track objects with both high precision and at significant distances. Radar cross-section, or RCS, is also crucial for the Aegis system. RCS measures how detectable objects are by radar. The military designs ships, aircraft, and missiles to have as low an RCS as possible to avoid detection. Aegis radars are designed to detect objects with very low RCS, making them highly effective. Currently, about 48 U.S. Navy destroyers are equipped with the Aegis system, making them capable of defending against ballistic missile threats. These ships use the Standard Missile 3, or SM-3, for intercepting ballistic missiles. The SM-3, which became operational in 2014, is designed specifically for missile defense rather than being an adaptation of an existing missile. It works by launching from ships or Aegis ashore systems and releasing a kill vehicle into space to collide with and neutralize an incoming warhead. The main limitation of the SM-3 is its range. The launching ship must be in the right position to intercept an ICBM. This makes SM-3s more suited for stopping intermediate-range missiles, while ground-based systems are necessary for longer-range threats. So far, everything sounds quite simple, right? Well, not exactly. When we talk about stopping an incoming missile, things get even trickier with the next challenge. Decoys. Imagine a Russian missile, like the R-36, also known as Satan, which during its flight can let go of what looks like 50 nuclear warheads. But in fact, only 10 of those are real warheads. These are called MERVs. And the rest, about 40, are just decoys meant to trick the defense systems. Suddenly, the defense has to figure out which of the 50 objects are the real threats that need to be stopped. It's not just the decoys that make this hard. Other parts of the missile, like the nose cone, can also confuse the defense systems. While some radars can keep track of these objects, they struggle to tell apart the real warheads from the fakes. That's where specialized radars come into play. The United States uses a special sea-based X-band radar mainly to pick out the real threats from the decoys and then keep a precise track on the real warheads. Another radar system, the Long Range Discrimination Radar, or LRDR, located at Clear Space Force Station in Alaska, has a similar role. It can tell which objects are the real deal and which are not, and then help guide the interceptor missiles accurately in real time. With all these tech and resources at hand, surely the U.S. will have no problem deterring a barrage of ICBMs, right? Unfortunately, no. The U.S. has a limited supply of interceptors, and a single interceptor alone could fetch millions of dollars, so buying more isn't economically viable. Each interceptor only has a 56% chance of successfully intercepting and destroying an ICBM. You would need four interceptor missiles to reach a 97% probability of destroying a lone ICBM. So imagine how easily interceptors can be overwhelmed by dozens of ICBMs. This is why the American Ballistic Missile Defense System has three layers of protection against ballistic missiles. 
Just one defense layer might stop some missiles, but using multiple layers, especially the last one called the terminal phase, can stop many or even all of them. The terminal phase is the last part of the missile's flight when it comes back into the Earth's atmosphere and is close to hitting its target. This phase is very quick, lasting only about a minute, and it's the final chance to intercept the missile. However, it's also the riskiest time for an interception because it happens near the intended target, and there's little room for mistakes. When a missile is intercepted, it doesn't explode like a nuclear bomb. A nuclear explosion requires a very specific trigger sequence that interception prevents. Instead, the interception would scatter radioactive debris, which is dangerous but less so than a nuclear explosion. The U.S. uses systems like THAAD, Terminal High Altitude Area Defense, SM-6 missiles from Navy ships, and the Army's Patriot Advanced Capability 3 missiles to intercept missiles during this terminal phase. But these systems are mainly effective against short to intermediate range missiles, not intercontinental ballistic missiles, which re-enter the atmosphere at speeds over Mach 24. THAAD, for example, might not catch an ICBM because its top speed is less than Mach 9, and it's aimed at intercepting missiles that move at Mach 5 to 8. An extreme measure for defense could involve deploying interceptors equipped with nuclear warheads to destroy incoming ICBMs by detonating a nuclear explosion against them. Basically, you'd be blowing up a nuke with another nuke. Can you imagine that? No matter what way you look at it, nuclear warfare is a loss for both sides.